The accused killer of the four University of Idaho students returns to the courtroom as court TV cameras capture every moment and every detail, including the cut on the defendant's face. What happened behind bars? And what happened inside the courtroom today? We have the details. Plus, we track the movements of the victims on the night of the murders. Where were they and what were they doing while the accused killer prepared for the murders? We trace Ethan, Zana, Maddie, and Kaylee's actions minute by minute. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight on Closing Arguments. Great to have you with us. And in the murder case in Idaho, back in the courtroom today. And this is significant on, on many different levels because early on in a case, some of the hearings are very important and some are organizational planning type of appearances. But when you're this early in a case, you start to get a little feel, a little flavor for how this thing may play out. First, you've got the lawyers interacting and you get to know who they are. Um, in this case, there's a magistrate right now in the courtroom, not the trial judge, but you get to see this back and forth and the way uh, whether the prosecution and defense are sort of working together, how adversarial they may be. And you also get to see the defendant and how the defendant acts in that environment as the center of attention as a, an accused, in this case, mass murderer. That's why tonight we're going to take a look at the body language of the suspect inside the court. And we're going to do that a little bit later on in this segment. And that's important also on a couple different levels. Number one, trying to understand um, some of the signals his body may be sending that his mouth is not because he's not saying much inside the courtroom. But how does he present himself? You know, the way you present yourself as a criminal defendant in a courtroom absolutely significant. I mean, I've covered trials of defendants who never took the stand, but the jury liked them. The jury loved them just because of the, the, the presence that they had inside the courtroom. It's absolutely amazing the impact that can, will, and does have. So for us, we are now observing this defendant for the very first couple of times being in that courtroom. Before this, he was nobody. Nobody knew who he was. Now everyone knows who he was, who he is. Everyone's staring at him, and ultimately 12 people in that community will be looking at him and judging him and deciding whether or not he's a killer. The other part of it is when you take a look at him and, and his demeanor and what you see, um, what does it tell you about him? What does it tell you about What's going on between the ears? You know, sometimes you can see someone, the way they act, whether it's the, the way the eyes are, the way um, they hunch over, whatever it is. Does it give us an insight into this person who's been accused of this horrific crime? You know, is this someone who is scared to be in the situation that they're in, or is this someone who is reveling in it? Is this someone who's psychopathic? And again, that's something that you can begin to get a flavor of by watching the way they act and react inside the courtroom. For instance, I mean, I've been, I've been thinking about this. It's Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy, um, this guy was pure evil. Uh, but initially, he was known as kind of like that, the, the handsome serial killer. Like, what was he like? Then when he got inside a courtroom and he started speaking and you got to see and hear him more and more, the, the evil was oozing out of this guy. And there were cameras inside the courtroom for one of his trials. Uh, so you got to see him act and react. And at times he was representing himself. And all of that revealed by, by the demeanor and, and, and the way he looked and what he said. Now, the, the big, big question about this defendant, this suspect in Idaho, is will he ever talk? Right? Will he ever talk? And, and, and that can come in many different forms. You know, sometimes it's, it's the back and forth with the judge. Uh, that's pretty limited. But 
If he gets in front of a jury and takes the stand, what story will he tell? Will we ever know what's happening here? And if he's convicted, will he ever talk? Will he ever tell his story? And will we ever understand who, who he is if he's convicted? Because at the end of the day, I think everyone wants to understand, we try to understand mass killers and serial killers to, to try to figure them out so we can help people who may fall into that world or help protect people who may be exposed to someone like that. Again, if he's convicted, right now he's presumed innocent. And that's the other thing you want to see in court. Is he acting like someone who's been wrongfully accused of the highest profile crime in the nation? So he was in court today. Let's take a look. So, Mr. Koberger, I need to speak to you for a moment then. Sir, you do understand, and Ms. Taylor has represented here, that she's advised you of your right to have, um, or fully discussed with you, the right that you have, which is to have your preliminary hearing within 14 days of the date that you initially appeared before this court. As you recall, um, when I advised you of your rights, that hearing is a probable cause hearing where the state has to establish that more likely than not, these felony offenses were committed and you were the one that committed the felony offenses. If you waive your right to a speedy preliminary hearing, it does not mean that you're giving up your right to have a preliminary hearing. It simply means that you would not be able to come back and challenge that the state did not present probable cause within 14 days. Do you understand? Yes. Have you had enough time to speak with Ms. Taylor about your decision to waive your right to a speedy preliminary hearing? Yes. Do you need any additional time to do so? No. Then I will ask at this time, as to the five counts, felony counts that were charged in the uh, criminal complaint that was filed on December 29th of 2022, are you waiving your right to a speedy preliminary hearing and agreeing that that hearing can be held outside the 14-day period? Yes. And Ms. Taylor, do you concur with his waiver? I do, Your Honor. Thank you. I will find your waiver of speedy preliminary hearing is knowing, intelligently, voluntarily entered here in open court with the assistance of counsel. We will go ahead and set the matter for a preliminary hearing. Monday, June 26th at 9 o'clock a.m. And I will go ahead and reserve uh, the week, so June 26th to June 30th, in the event that uh, we need all five days for presentation of evidence. And just so council knows, um, it will begin at 9 a.m. each of those days. I know what you're all thinking. What's going on with his face? You see that? Like, like was this side, right? Looked like there were a couple cuts or scratches. What's going on? Let's bring in Core TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter live tonight from downtown Moscow. Chanley, great to see you. Um, what's going on with with the with the defendants, the accused killer's face in court today? Yeah, Vinny, uh, that was quite noticeable with our Core TV camera zooming in on him. And I noticed a difference just sitting there. It's like, there's something darker. I put on my eyeglasses. I couldn't tell, but thankfully we had the zoom lens and it looked like scratches, red marks on his chin and neck area. And so I followed up to investigate, you know, why, what led to that? The sheriff telling me that that was because he shaved his face this morning in preparation to come to court. And I guess he didn't do a very good job, Vinny. Cut himself shaving. Well, that's like two bad cuts. Might not have had a good razor. I don't know what they give you at the jail. I don't know if they're brand new. Maybe a little bit old, maybe a little rusty. Who knows? Um, also noticing his hair. I'm looking at that. I mean, that's not yes. hair product, right? He's just, he took a shower, uh, I guess pretty close to appearing in court. Or are they giving him gel these days? You know, I was wondering the same thing. In fact, I think I may follow up with the sheriff. I followed up on, the ha on a haircut because maybe it was the haircut that was different, but I think it's more what you said. Either it's still wet from his shower and shave or some sort of product maybe they have in the uh, in the gel uh, for him to use on his hair. But that was a noticeable, dis noticeable difference as well. Also, you notice he's just wearing his T-shirt today. Uh, last week when his first appearance, he had on the whole gel jumpsuit with the Latow County you know, logo on the back of it. Um, and when he walked did Vinny 
really the only thing you could hear inside the courtroom, jam-packed, by the way, were the clankings of his shackles, his ankle shackles. So that's a consistent thing. It's not, he's not shackled at his, his wrist, obviously, there. And I also noticed that he didn't greet his public defender with the smile like he did last week at his first appearance. In fact, I'm watching. He doesn't really even look at her there. Uh, he doesn't look towards the gallery, of course, too. And here's a comparison. Pretty similar, but you're going to see him in last week's turn and greet his defense attorney with kind of a smile there. So his body language overall read really different to me inside the courtroom today. He seemed a bit more defeated today with his body language, not as confident and comfortable as he seemed last week when he made that first appearance inside the courtroom, Vinny. Yeah, it could be a little reality settling in. Uh, jail's never easy. Um, wow. But the, the hair definitely different, though, because it, I think wet looks a little darker as well uh, because of the, the whatever's in that hair. All right, what else can you tell us about today's hearing? Well, uh, I can tell you that in the gallery, the, the family, the row reserved for the family that I've been telling you about, nobody was sitting there. That was stark, but there was a representative of the Gonsalves family, Kaylee Gonsalves' family, the attorney, and we have a soundbite uh, from him because I wanted to ask him as well because he was there last week too in the courtroom and he had the best seat today as far as the view of the defendant. So I wanted to pick his brain about whether or not he felt there was a difference in Koberger's demeanor and this is actually what he told me. I think the big difference was his appearance, appearance in Pennsylvania. He was seemed a little bit more lighthearted. He had turned around to his family, I think, and mouthed like I love you or something along those lines. And then his first appearance here in, in Latah County it, it seemed he seemed much more reserved, um, uh, a little bit more concerned uh, about things. Um, and I that was consistent with the way he was today. Um, I think probably in Pennsylvania, he hadn't read the probable cause affidavit yet. And so now that he's he's read the probable cause affidavit and understands the evidence that's against him, he might be a little bit more concerned. <sighs> I think that's a valid point as well. Maybe like you said, Vinny, is setting in a little bit more. Another thing that I noticed today, and it may just be me because he didn't have on that other shirt, he looked maybe like he lost a little bit of weight. It's been widely reported he has a picky diet, a vegan diet, and I know that the jail is doing its best to accommodate that, but we also know that he's being held by himself. He's not even able to mingle with the other inmates. He can have visitors and take phone calls, but the sheriff uh, gives us a glimpse of his life inside this jail behind me. Let's watch. He'll be housed in uh, a separate cell. Um, we'll have some extra security. That's what a lot of the questions are. He's not guilty, right, he, until he goes through court and everything. So he's, you know, he's going to be in my jail, but he's not going to be, you know, treated any different than anybody else in my jail. So. We also know here at the jail there is, you know, a courtyard, so he likely has time outside and there's also a library Vinny. but as far as more details of the day in and day out this expansive gag order that the court put in place uh, over the parties the jail and officials have felt that they also need to abide by that so only a few details coming out on actually what's happening behind those doors behind me absolutely and you know when you you look at him he could be losing weight because he could be eating less um than he was before. It's very common in jail. We saw it with Alec Murdoch. I mean, he went whoosh, like, like a rail down in South Carolina. Uh, he's put a few more back on, but it, it's, it's not uncommon and uh, interesting to see. So waiving the, the preliminary hearing. So we're not gonna have a, a preliminary hearing in this until the summer. Yeah, we're gonna have to wait several months. So Koberger is agreeing to put off this preliminary hearing, we must wait until June for his defense, but we are learning they're going to challenge the prosecution's evidence. They want to have this time to prepare for the preliminary hearing. It's going to be five days, or that's what it's scheduled to be, uh, Vinny, and we know that it's much like a mini trial where prosecutors must put on evidence to prove it's more likely than not that he is the man responsible for these murders. It's a time when the defense could call witnesses, cross-examine witnesses. We could have a glimpse into the strategy of the defense at this preliminary hearing. So that's all unfolding and we will have to wait those months. That's his next uh, court date, Vinny, June the 26th preliminary hearing. And then it would move up into court where he would then have a formal arraignment 
plead guilty or not guilty. And at the end of the day, um, everything I'm hearing is that the attorney he has is very, very formidable, um, really good. So uh, this will be a fascinating preliminary hearing uh, to witness. Chanley Painter, I know we're going to talk some more in just a bit, but I want to bring in our body language expert joining us in Fayetteville, North Carolina, body language expert, senior instructor at the Body Language Institute and author of I Can See What Your Body Is Saying, Rodney Smith back with us. Rodney, great to see you tonight. I, I wanted to begin, I know there's not a lot to go from, it's very limited, uh, the angle and everything else, but I want to show you side by side um, this defendant in Idaho. Uh, the, his first appearance will be on the left side, and then today is on the right side. Um, are you seeing much of a difference uh, after spending a week in Idaho? Yeah, so... Initially taking a look at the, the video and now seeing the side by side, uh, the one on the left where he's actually wearing the, the actual, the, the top that actually has the writing on it versus the one on the t-shirt. When he comes in, he does make direct eye contact uh, with the attorney and he gives her more of a polite, si polite smile, not so much of a gen genuine smile, but more of a polite uh, smile. In the clip on the right, as he is actually entering in, we, we uh, can notice that she actually adjusts the chair to turn it in his direction to allow him to come in. When he comes in, he never makes any contact with her. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't greet her, he makes no eye contact. He just goes in and directly sits down in the chair. And even on the exit, as we just saw, uh, he gets up, he turns around, and just exits the courtroom. He never acknowledges her nor looks in her direction during this entire uh, time in the courtroom. So I'm wondering if uh, there's something going on that has taken place during their interaction in the, the, the past time that he's been incarcerated up until this point for him not to want to give her any acknowledgement whatsoever. Yeah, well... A big part of it is, I, I think today, you know, was the day where they go on the record telling the judge that no, no preliminary hearing in the next 14 days, which by law he's entitled to, we're going to wait several months. So maybe a realization of, listen, I'm not going anywhere for until June. Like nothing's, nothing's going to happen in this case until June. Absolutely. Um, you know, when, when he actually first comes in and sits down on the table, or sits down in the chair, he starts off with his hands on top of the table because interestingly, as we notice, he comes in, he's not shackled, he's not handcuffed. Uh, but when he sits down, one of the first things that he does is he adjusts his seat and then he puts his hands on the table, but he puts them in the, in the ringing position, almost a hand clasp. And that could be signs of stress or anxiety that's built up inside of him. Once the judge actually comes in after they tell them to, to all rise and he takes a seat, he actually brings his hands from on top of the table and then conceals them. Uh, this, this could be a sign of trying to conceal this anxiety or this inter interior stress that's actually going on inside of him. Uh, and uh, another thing, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead no, go ahead. I was, I was just going to ask you any other uh, observations you made of this defendant? Again, I know very limited um, uh, footage that we have for you today. Yeah, well, and even though it's, it's, it was only a couple of minutes of footage, it, it was very interesting. Uh, you know, some of the footage that you see in some of the photos, they show him with his eyes wide open, and some might say that it seems to be that of uh, some type of psychopathic stare or what have you. Uh, but throughout the entirety of him sitting in the chair, one can actually tell he is paying attention. He is very attentive. When the judge is speaking to him, he gives the triple nod acknowledging that he is hearing her, that he is uh, paying attention to everything that she says. Uh, we do notice that when she references the part about the, he had the opportunity for the probable cause hearing or to be able to recognize the documents and those things of that nature, we see a little bit of jaw clenching going on. Uh, when she actually says that you were the one who committed the felony offenses, uh, we, we see the jaw clenching there as well. Now. In conjunction with the jaw, we don't see any of this brow furrowing, which could be indicative of anger. But this jaw clenching and this little bit of lip licking, he does a little bit of tucking of that bottom lip. And he, he also licks his bottom lip just only about once or twice throughout this clip. But this is definitely not an individual that is in control. And I believe that this jaw clenching is a sign that he is 
holding in, he's repressing his nervousness, his stress. He's under high anxiety. Uh, we notice that even more when his attorney gets up to speak on his behalf. Uh, the jaw clenching begin, uh, actually gets uh, more and more and more, it seems to grow as though she, uh, as, as she actually talks throughout her conversation. Rodney Smith, body language expert. We're going to be calling on you again and again throughout 2023. Thank you so much for your help tonight. Thank you, Vinny. All right. We've got a lot more to get to. Uh, Chanley Painter still live in Moscow for us. Plus, coming up next hour. In Chula Vista, California, mother of three, Maya Miliette, disappeared two years ago. She has never been found. But her husband, Larry, has been charged with her murder. Today, emotions high inside the courtroom during day two of his preliminary hearing as Maya's sister takes the stand. She said, if something happens to me, what's it gonna be Larry? ever comes back, I'll try the damn thing again because Mark Jensen belongs in prison. Mark Jensen. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of intentional homicide. She was poisoned by him using ethylene glycol. Set to be retried after his conviction was overturned. He deserves a new trial that is a fair trial. Now, a second jury will determine his fate. And our cameras will bring you every moment. The Antifreeze Murder Retrial. Live coverage weekday mornings, 9, 8 central, only on... Five. Have a good night. Bye. Hey, Joseph. Hello. Hi. Welcome back. Hi. I would like the, um... Thank you. 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 Thank of the uh, sounds and video that we get of two of the victims in the Idaho case. And what I want to do right now is, is go through what the four victims were doing in, in, the, in the minutes and hours before they were murdered. And I want to do that because it seems prosecutors have laid out what they believe the timeline is for the man responsible for the murder. So what's going on with these four in the minutes leading up to that. Let's bring back in Chanley Pager, Court TV legal correspondent. She's in Moscow, Idaho tonight. Chanley, um, can you put that together for us, kind of trace and track um, what the four victims are doing? Because according to prosecutors, they have their theory on what the defendant was doing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important to put all of these pieces together and build a crucial timeline that we expect to be central to the prosecution's case in this trial. So let's start. This is the evening of November 13th. This is a big day in town. The University of Idaho just had a football game and college students are out and about across town. Well, let's zero in on what the four victims are doing. So let's start at 9 p.m. That's when we know Ethan Chapin and his girlfriend, Zana Cornodal, are at the Sigma Chi house where... You know, Ethan is a member of the Sigma Chi House, and it's walking distance, again, maybe two football fields away from Xana Kernodal's home. We know that from 10 p.m. to about 1.30 a.m., Madison Mulgan and Kayla Gonsalves are at the Corner Club. Now, the Corner Club is a bar in downtown Moscow. I've been there. It's very much a kind of cheers type of atmosphere. They have a shuffleboard game, and my photographer, Paul, beat me horribly at that game when we were there. But um, just a, a fun atmosphere to be in and a short walking distance from where Kaylee and Maddie are located next at 1.40 a.m., they are seen at the, gub tr the grub truck, excuse me, on their live stream Twitch video. It's the grub truck, again, on Main Street, downtown Moscow. It is uh, a place that serves all different types of mac and cheese. I went there last night because it was their first night to be reopened after the winter break, and it was popping like it is in the survey, the Twitch video that we've been seeing the night Kaylee and Maddie were there. Tons of students, not just from Moscow here at the University of Idaho, but from WSU that cross over the border to come eat at the Grub Truck late night popular destination to grab some food. So that's about 1.40 a.m. Kaylee and Maddie are there. At 1.45 a.m., Zana and Ethan, that's when they return back to 
is in his home. That King Road residence. And we know by 1:56 a.m. that Maddie and Kaylee they got a, a ride back to their house, so they're there before 2 a.m. At 2:42 a.m. Now here's where we know the probable cause affidavit picks up Brian Koberger's movements. His cell phone allegedly places him at his home in Pullman, Washington, that apartment that we've shown you many times, Vinny. By 2.26 a.m. to 2.52 a.m., we know that Kaylee and Maddie, they're in their back home, likely on that third floor, but they are repeatedly calling and texting Kaylee's ex-boyfriend, Jack DeCor, who we know didn't live far from that home. So they're still awake. 2.47 a.m., that's when Koberger cell allegedly is, is traveling south through Pullman, Washington, and then as I showed you last night, it is turned off before the vehicle is seen moving towards Moscow, Idaho at 2.47 a.m. So let's get forward to 3.29 a.m. Multiple sightings of the suspect vehicle, that white Hondre Elantra, are seen on King Road, again, where the victims are likely asleep. The vehicle makes three initial passes by the King Road residence, as we've shown you, Vinny, before making that fourth and final pass, because at 4 a.m., Santa Colonel receives a DoorDash delivery around 4 a.m. 404, that's when this white Honda Elantra is seen entering for that fourth time. That's when he turns around on that King Road multiple times and then finally towards the house. The affidavit says that by 4.20 a.m., that's when the murders had happened between that time frame because at 4.20 a.m., that suspect vehicle is seen on video speeding away through the back way south of Moscow. Here's a pass by that home that we've shown you multiple times. So those video canvases really piecing the puzzle together, but you know, I have to say those periods of time where he allegedly turns his phone off, but he's seen on video in that suspect video or the, or the suspect vehicle seen on video. And then what he immediately does after speeding away from that home at 420, we're going to put all that together for you tomorrow night too. So there's so many more pieces of this puzzle. What's really fascinating to me and, and is that the DoorDash, the DoorDash delivery of 404 and, or 4 o'clock, around 4 o'clock, and he's coming into that neighborhood at like 404 and sometimes between 404 and 420 is when all of this is allegedly happening. That DoorDash just had to like just pull out. I mean, that frame, and mm -hmm. that means Anna's awake. She's got to be awake yeah, when the killer enters the home, like totally awake, but doesn't hear. Does she hear it when he breaks in and then that's when she gets murdered first? Or does she just kind of not paying attention to what's going on, doesn't necessarily hear him come in? To me, that is such a, a baffling part of this. It really is. And remember that fourth and final pass by at 404 by the suspect vehicle. I'm thinking maybe that's because of the DoorDash driver being there. Maybe he has to make one more turnaround, waiting for this DoorDash delivery to leave before making his move. And yes, Zana Cornodal's on her TikTok app at 4.12 a.m. That perp, he is in the home. He is in the home when she's on her TikTok app. She's either not aware, he went immediately upstairs, or maybe she hears something. Because remember in the affidavit, she's also the only one, it seems, found on the floor deceased all the others according to the affidavit found in the beds deceased so maybe she did get up at one point because she heard something Vinny. all right chanley painter in moscow for us we're going to check in with you in, in uh, uh we'll be right back with you because when we come back chanley spoke with the gonsalves family attorney today interesting information that she got we'll have that for you next Life of Alec Murdoch is bizarre. It is complicated. This great South Carolina attorney is charged with the murders of his own wife and son. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Who exactly is this guy? Everybody knows the Murdochs. It's a household name. A family that is so powerful. Who knows where this thing is going to end? This case needs to be resolved. We need to put this behind us and move on. Murdoch Family Murders. Live coverage beginning January 23rd. Only on Court and... wanted him to look me in the eye. He knows I want him to look him in the eye. So he's, he, he didn't, he didn't give me that opportunity. So I think he's, uh, understands that I'm not gonna see 
something in his eyes that I want to see, you know? I want to see an innocent man, but uh, I feel like he's just scared to look at me in the eyes and uh, start to understand what's about to happen to him. That's Kaylee's father, Steve Gonsalves, uh, speaking after last week's hearing, the first appearance of the accused killer in an Idaho courtroom. He was back in today. Um, Steve Gonsalves wasn't there, but the family attorney was, and Chanley Painter spoke with him. Let's take a listen. And you were representing the Gonsalves family. Why weren't they able to be present in court today? Well, they all, everybody has their own lives. They have jobs that they have to go to and, and they have a family that they still need to raise. And, and so there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that, uh, the family still has to do day to day. Um, but someone from the Gonzalez family will always be there in court. You're so close to them. And last time I talked to you, you spoke about how it's almost become personal to you as well. And how are they doing? Uh, it's been a couple of weeks now. He's made a second appearance in court. Uh, can you give us an update? Well, I don't think anything really changes, you know, their daughter was murdered in November. And so it's, you know, it's been a couple of months. Uh, those feelings are still raw. I think it was a relief that they took someone into custody on the case. We have a name and a face, um, but, you know, it's still a, a hard process for them and they have good days and bad days. And the good days aren't really good days. They're just days where they're not, you know, thinking about it all day long. So, you know, they still have to work. They have other children. They still have to raise their family and, and do all the things that you have to do just to live day in and day out. Well, I think we were all surprised that the preliminary hearing was set six months out. Um, I suspected it would they would have it within the next, you know, month, at maybe two months at the most. Um, because it is just a probable cause hearing. You know, it's based on the totality of the circumstances, and um, it's not the case. It's not a trial, um, but the defense can cross-examine witnesses, and the defense can bring in um, witnesses of their own uh, to testify at the preliminary hearing as well. So, But I, I think we're all surprised it's six months out. I think the family is would like the, the death penalty. Uh, Idaho is a death penalty state. Uh, I think it's something that they would want as a resolution on this case if there's a conviction. Um, I think that's something, obviously, that the uh, prosecutor's office, Slaytaw County Prosecutor's Office, would have to speak with all of the victims' families and see where that uh, that leads them uh, regarding down the line. But we kind of cross those bridges when we come to it. Um, you know, we're still real early on, and, and we, we don't even have a probable cause hearing scheduled for six months from now. So that's a long way from a trial and a conviction. First of all, are you surprised at how much information the probable cause affidavit contained and then of course what is standing out to you yeah i mean the, the that was a pretty lengthy probable cause affidavit it's one of the lengthiest ones i've ever seen um uh, but i think they were very you know they wanted to provide as much information as they could uh to establish probable cause and it it laid out a little bit of the state's case how they might proceed on the case at trial um but there's a lot of still other circumstantial evidence that uh, will be gathered between now and the trial date. You know, you still have three other crime scenes. You have his apartment, you have the car, you have uh, his parents' house that all need to be processed for evidence um, of the crime. And then any other evidence that comes in between now and then. Um, but the probable cause, I mean, I, I thought that, you know, it was it was well done. Um, you know, the, I think the biggest piece of evidence that jumps out to you is the DNA evidence on the sheet. I think that's the that's the the one piece of evidence that will be hard to explain uh, as a defense attorney on the case. You know, the cell phone evidence was seems uh, convincing as well as the video evidence tracking the the vehicle as well. So, you know, there was a lot of things in there that were that helped them ease their mind a little bit about the prosecution. So what are you telling the family? What's next? What are you telling them? And what are you expecting? Well, we're in the next couple of weeks, we're going to schedule a meeting with uh, uh, Bill Thompson's office and the prosecutor's office and sit down with them and try to get a feel for what their thoughts are moving forward on the case and and things along those lines. So that's our, our next plan is to try to schedule that meeting and, and get that taken care of. <sighs> I'll tell you what, it's so important for the families to have a representative like that. It, 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 it helps immensely. I've seen families go through this without it, and it's tough. Chanley Painter still with us in Moscow. Chanley, anything else come out of uh, your interview? 
Absolutely. Well, what was interesting to me, he says, last time I talked to him, the Gonzalez family was looking for connections. They have access to Kits and McKaylee's devices and password-protected information. Any connection with O'Brien Koberger, he says now they know there is no connection previous to this between Kaylee Gonzalez and Brian Koberger. They said that they knew about the sheath but didn't know about the DNA. That was surprising to them. But also, he talks about the eyewitness to this. Dylan Mortensen, the roommate in the home, the, one of the surviving roommates who had her eyes on the perpetrator. This is what he said about her. We had knew early on that there might be a witness, um, but we didn't know the details of that. And the fact that the roommate had given a uh, an identification of the defendant in the case, um, I think that was that was important. Describe for us, because I know Steve and the family members have have talked about that. Uh, their reaction to that, they don't blame her, right? No, she is a victim in this case, and everybody needs to treat her as a victim in this case. I'm not sure anybody knows what they would do uh, in that situation. Uh, that we are thankful to her that she was able to get an identification. It bolsters the case, uh, the identification of a athletic build, bushy eyebrows, some of the clothing that he was wearing. So maybe they might be able to find that clothing um, that's similar to the identification, but she is, she's a victim and everyone needs to show compassion and kindness towards her. Um, and so there's, uh, the family is, is appreciative of, of everything that she's doing for the prosecution of the case. We'll see where this leads, Vinny, but he also told me and confirmed that Steve Gonzalez Gonsalves believes that this perpetrator was close enough to this home with his cell phone. He was picking up that Wi-Fi in that crime scene home.